The world is complex. Closed loop systems are complex. Sustainability is complex. And like anything complex, we need a multi-dimensional perspective when trying to understand it. When trying to think about concepts like planetary boundaries, rebound effects, tipping points, we need to understand these with the appropriate framework. I'm going to walk you through how I think about sustainability and what framework I use and that we can use to update how we think about the world. I was first introduced to the concept of mental models about 10 years ago from a colleague and good friend of mine. Mental models was conceptualized by Charlie Munger in his book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, and it's how he thinks about the world. Charlie Munger, for those of you who don't know, was the co-founder of Berkshire Hathaway, along with Warren Buffett. More recently, mental models were popularized by an individual called Shane Parrish in his blog, Farnham Street Blog. Effectively, what mental models are, are a framework for thinking about the world and making better decisions. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of mental models that I use, particularly when it relates to how I think about sustainability. So the first one is second and third order consequences. You can never think about the immediate consequence of your decision. You always have to think about the consequence of those consequences. And if you can, even the consequences of those following consequences. The entire point is to think about the life cycle of impact that one action will trigger. How this relates to sustainability is when you think about buying a bottle of water, the immediate consequence is that you get hydrated. But what happens to that plastic bottle after that? It'll get picked up and most likely get thrown into a landfill. From there, probably it'll get incinerated. And if it doesn't, it'll go and get thrown into the ocean. From there, it bio or degrades down to microplastics and gets eaten by fish and usually ends up back in our own food chain. When you think about the entire life cycle of a particular action, you can fully value its consequences and you can also price and value the impact that that'll have. So that's extremely useful when now I think about certain decisions that I take on a day-to-day -day basis and I understand what is the true impact this can have. The second model is around <laughs> incentives. All creatures on this earth are driven by incentives. Humans are a little trickier because we have hidden incentives. We have intangible incentives, but incentives nonetheless. And like all creatures, our entire behavior and actions are solely driven by different incentives. So how does this apply to sustainability? It's when you think about what you do consciously or subconsciously on a day-to-day -day basis. When I first learned about this particular mental model, I started questioning basic things I used to do on a day-to-day -day basis. For instance, whenever I would go for a walk, I would immediately put in my headphones and start listening to music. Or when I used to have a couple of minutes to spare, I would immediately flip out my phone. Funnily enough, social media platforms take advantage of human incentives in a very big way. They have this particular notion called variable rewards, which incentivizes humans to scroll endlessly on their phone because they never know what they might get in return. This is what's defined now as the endless scroll on Instagram, for instance. The point of this is that the more we can actually understand and consciously identify what incentives are driving our behavior, the more we can control them. For instance, we built an entire ecosystem today around mass consumption. There's corporations whose sole objective it is to drive more consumption behavior. And I fundamentally feel like if we can just reduce our own consumption, we can really make a big dent in how we think about climate change and have a net positive effect. The third mental model is around critical mass and emergence. Critical mass refers to the level at which a system changes phases, like water to ice. Emergence is when higher order consequences occur from the interactions between lower order components. The scariest part about emergence is that you can't actually predict these higher order consequences just by studying those lower order components. 
So how does this relate to sustainability? Critical mass is basically what climatologists refer to as tipping points or planetary boundaries. It's those levels at which we know the system, which is Earth, will break. And in all closed loop systems, all of these levels exist. With emergence, we know that at these certain levels, there are certain higher order consequences that we can't predict. We just know that these will occur. We're already starting to see the initial outcomes of some of our actions. Floods in Germany that haven't occurred in decades. Mass fires in California and Australia. This is just the beginning. And the scariest part is no climatologist can tell us what will actually happen when we hit these planetary boundaries. We don't even know what levels these are. All we can do is guess. We don't know how nature will react. We don't know how biodiversity will react. We don't know how certain species will react or weather. We simply don't know enough. All we know is that we're getting closer to reaching these points. And at these points, systems break. And when they do, we don't know what will happen. The point is that mental models are a great way to think about sustainability and extend our framework. But honestly, it goes even beyond that. One of the biggest things that I've realized in sustainability is that we can't think about sustainability in silos. We can't simply think about just energy or just biodiversity or just water usage. Everything is interrelated. And like any closed loop system, everything interacts with each other. And so that's why when we think about desalination, you can't think about desal without thinking about the energy consumed in the process. Or when we think about setting up offshore wind farms, you can't think about that without understanding the biodiversity of the ocean that it's destroying in the process. Or when we start promoting regenerative agriculture, we can't do that without thinking about the water consumption in that process. The point is that there are always trade-offs and we need to think about all these trade-offs when making decisions. For example, take water. 21 cities in India are forecasted to run out of water by 2030, according to the World Bank. We have about 70% contaminated water. Our water quality ranks one of the lowest in the world. We're home to over 18% of the world's population, but we only have access to 4% of global water resources. The water situation is dire. And if we don't think about how we use water, then we shouldn't necessarily be making some of the decisions that we are today. To quote Ben Franklin, we only know the wealth value of water until the well is dry. That we rarely take into consideration in our decisions is biodiversity and the impact certain things have on this. Biodiversity is an integral part of the earth and also regulating our internal systems. Let's think about just some basic facts. Humans and our livestock constitute about 96% of all mammals mass on this earth. Over the last 50 years, we've eradicated 60% of wild animals. Forests, soil, and coral reefs form the largest natural carbon sequestration systems. Yet we're slowly eradicating these two so rather than invest in technologies that sequester carbon from the air, why not just invest in rebuilding this biodiversity? The WWF has said, the loss of biodiversity is the greatest threat to humanity. We need to start factoring biodiversity and the impact certain decisions will have on this if we really want to make a dent in climate change. The last example is about data. Do you ever think about the energy footprint of your data footprint? Do you ever think that there's a cost to streaming Netflix all night, forwarding videos on WhatsApp, or streaming the internet for hours and hours at a time? There is, there is a massive cost. In fact, at the beginning of 2020, it was estimated that humans consumed about 44 zettabytes of data. That's 40 times more bytes 
than stars in the observable universe. Hidden costs are basically things that aren't priced into what we actually buy. For instance, if you're buying an avocado in Mumbai, you may have paid for it, but you're not truly paying for it. You're not paying for the transportation costs and the emissions associated with that to bringing that avocado to your doorstep. You're not paying for the water consumed in growing that avocado tree, which is massive. And when we don't think about these costs, we also don't reduce our demand for certain things. When we're buying a bottle of water, we don't think about the hidden cost associated with that. And that's kind of what I want to leave you with today. My call to action is this. We need to fundamentally shift how we think about sustainability and consume less. Sustainability is much more than greenhouse gas emissions. It affects a lot of other different things, and we need to start factoring these things into our own actions and behavior. As an individual, corporation, or civil body, sustainability should become part of our DNA. We need to start thinking about the true impact of our actions. And if there's one message I can leave any viewer with, it's this. Consume less, and the world will reap the benefits.